Hello all, uh, welcome to our webinar on programming for older adults. I have with us Megan Ginther, manager of Carstairs Public Library, uh, who I've just recently been informed is part of Parkland Library System, not Marigold. So um, we're just gonna give everyone a few minutes to trickle in now that the session is live. Um, in the meantime, uh, Megan, did you have any preambulatory statements? No, no. <laughs> I don't have a lot. <laughs> I'll cover it as we go through the presentation. So. Okay. So uh, just normal housekeeping. This is a live presentation, not pre-recorded, which means everyone has the opportunity to hammer questions into the question box that should be on your screens right now. Um, feel free to ask anything, everything, even just double thumbs up comments or great idea or high five Megan. Um, and then I'll make sure that she is apprised of your comments uh, as we take breaks for uh, discussing your feedback. Um, if you have any specific requests, I think there's a chat function which allows you to communicate directly to me or Megan. Uh, so if you're having any technical difficulties, let me know. Um, otherwise, uh, there might also be a raise hand button. So uh, feel free to use that as well. And I will make sure that I, uh, take a look at that and make sure that uh, we, we cover everything as thoroughly as possible. Um, final housekeeping note, uh, this session is being recorded. Uh, we have PowerPoint presentation slides that Megan will be using, which uh, she will make available to everybody after the fact. So don't feel like you have to take meticulous notes throughout the presentation. Um, the recording itself will be available um, uh, through YRL's Niche Academy, uh, where we're going to host it. Um, but I'm also more than happy to just share the recording with anybody who wants it for their own pur personal purposes to review or share with their own staff or colleagues. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to turn control over this whole party over to you, Megan. Um, okay. Yeah. Excellent. I'm just going to... Oh, now I made everything disappear before I shared. Gonna share my screen. Hit present. Okay. Ben, can you let me know if everyone's seeing what I'm seeing? Uh, yes. <laughs> for, uh, for older adults. Yep, they it's should see our people. two smiling faces at the top of the screen and the slides of a bunch of people really enjoying their coffee down below. So perfect. That, that is exactly what I'm seeing. Good. Perfect. Excellent. So Thank you, everyone. I want to just reiterate, too, if you have any questions, this is really your presentation as well. So feel free to shoot questions in the chat box. I will stop and answer anything So as we're going. Um, so if you need more information, I'm going too fast, too slow, let me know, and we'll, we'll, we'll take that into account. So today, we're going to cover three things. We're just going to first do some background information on what is an older adult. We're going to look at some of the groundwork, so what you need to consider when planning a program to set yourself up. And then I'm going to spend the most time on number three, which is example programs. So I have a bunch of different examples and things you can borrow and use um, freely. So I'll also start by introducing myself. My name is Megan. I'm the library manager here at Carstairs. If you don't know where Carstairs is, that's okay. We're just a little north of Calgary, so about 45 minutes outside. Um, I have been working in libraries since I was about 20, but honestly, I've been a library lover since I was a child. Um, when I was doing my master's, I actually thought I was going to be a youth services librarian but at the same time sort of fell in love with doing seniors programming. So that's kind of my background. Um, I've, I've done all sorts of different things. I've worked for EPL for a number of years with the literacy van, and then I've now come here to work as a manager and kind of do a little bit of everything. So um, that is that. So we're gonna just start with what is an older adult? So I've got three different people up here. I have Jacob, he's 55, he's still working. Yoon and Alex, 65 and 69, they've just retired. They're starting to think about doing the snowbird thing. And I have Monica, she's 78, and she's living in a retirement home. 
um, is um, any one of these who you would consider as an older adult? I know it's a question. Give you a second to think about it. Um, by definition, all three, all four of these individuals are considered older adults. Um, 55 is usually considered the age that older adults starts at, which is a lot, I think, younger than most people think. But traditionally, 65, that age of retirement, is when people really start to consider themselves older adults, perhaps. Um, and that's usually when we tend to start thinking about them. But by capturing someone when they're 55 and getting them involved in your programs, you're building them in. So <laughs> that. So um, I had the question of like, which groups are you programming for? I know that's a little tricky with the chat, but if you have a moment to chat, in, send in, are you programming for the Jacobs? Are you programming for the Yoon and Alex? Are you programming for Monica? All three. Not seen a bunch pop up yet, but. Uh, Holly indicates that they're doing all three. Uh, okay. Gail says at uh, AWA, uh, they're doing two and three. Uh, mm -hmm. Lana is saying that she does all three. So it seems like, at the very least, you and Alec and Monica are getting a lot of programming. <laughs> um, Kyle Perfect. indicates that uh, they do program for all age groups, but uh, sometimes there's limited active programming for some of these people. So. It's true, and it can be difficult depending on what circumstances they're living in. Some of them in the retirement homes, it can be tricky to reach them because they maybe can't come to us. Um, the Jacobs, they're still working. They can be tricky to reach because they're focused on that part of their career. So. Um, just things to consider is that it is a little bit wider than what I think when I first hear seniors, what I picture is mostly the Monica's. And so just wanted to diversify that picture a little bit. So this is where I start is with who their needs and wants. So any program that I do, the first thing I sort of start and spend some time on is considering what they need and what they maybe want from our programs. So with um, older adults, some of the things to consider is that aging brings a lot of changes. This can include things like sight, mobility, hearing, cognition. Uh, it brings big lifestyle changes. Um, you get your retirement. You might be having to change homes. You might be... Um, living with your children again like this could really it's it's really unique to every individual so you can't really assume but it, there's a lot of changes i mean it, it mirrors in a lot of ways that changes that happen from teen to adult right because you're you're moving out your housing is changing so um there's a lot going on there and the other thing that's really helpful these people are old enough you can ask so um I do a lot of like dot -ocrimi, dot, dot, democracy where you put up a question and they can vote and put post-it notes and things. I do a lot of those up to gather what people are interested in for topics. Um, I, I chat with people. I target certain people I haven't seen at a program and I'll ask maybe what they're interested in. Most people aren't shy to suggest topics or interests as long as you ask them, they're, they're usually flattered to be asked. And the other part I really spend some time is thinking about is why am I doing this programming? One of the very obvious reasons is older adults are one of the fastest growing age groups in the world. Um, they are also big contributors to our community. This is a big pool of potential volunteers, potential donors, potential just library users that'll be active. So we really want to engage them and get them involved in our libraries as well, right? They're gonna, if they're enjoying it, they'll um, they'll bring others with them, right? Um, the other thing I do in the ask is, um, I have a lot of snowbirds here. I don't know if your community has that, 
but I ask my snowbirds when they're traveling if they they hear of awesome things wherever they're, they're, they winter because they tend to be library users there as well. If there's a program that sounds really awesome there, I, I ask them to come and tell me about it. Um, bring me a program guide. Um, that can be a great way to, to have that connection with them. Um, did anyone have any questions on that? Not hearing anything. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think I'm seeing the chat, Ben. So, <laughs> yeah, the chat is mostly um, just coming to you. It's okay. it's not the best feature. Um, however, um, people can plug in uh, questions and comments directly into the questions interface. I think is what it's called for participants, um, and that's how they were giving us feedback before. And I'm not seeing anything right now. So, perfect. Thanks, Ben. So then I'm going to go on. Um, there is one group of older adults that I give a little special consideration to, and this is partly because I've done a lot of work with memory care um, wards when I was working in Edmonton, um, but that's working with people with memory issues. Um, so memory issues can be really challenging, both for a presenter like us, and a programmer, but it can also be challenging for their caregivers and family members. And they can really benefit from library services, but they are often very overlooked. Um, they can be a little invisible in our communities um, and very isolated. But um, current statistics say uh, five to 8% of adults are experiencing some form of dementia. And I do wanna mention dementia is a big, broad term that includes things like Alzheimer's, but it can also include sometimes having a urinary tract infection can cause temporary dementia, medication can cause memory issues, like all sorts of people can be included in that that may not even be captured in that five to eight percent. So this group is worth thinking about and offering some things for. And some special things that you can do and things that we can offer is programs and, and services. Um, we do take home kits and things too that offer stimulation for the brain. The more you use it, the better you know, it is, the more you can maintain. So things like puzzles, um, music is really good for stimulating the brain. Uh, reading aloud or audiobooks can be good, conversation groups. Um, and all of these things are things that can ben benefit everybody, right? We, we all can benefit from exercising our brain and being engaged in conversation. So it's not like um, when we program for this group, we can't include everyone else. I just like to keep it in the back of my mind when I'm planning is how can I, how can I work in some elements that can help those that might be experiencing some memory issues. And another one is that the caregiver can often feel so isolated. So connection building is really helpful and having a place where it's safe for them to bring maybe the person they're caring for. It's oftentimes it's a spouse caring for another spouse, but it could be a child, an adult child caring for their older adult parent with memory issues. So having a safe place where they can come, they know that they're, the person they're caring for is being um, needs are being met, but also that they have a chance to talk to someone that isn't just that person, that they can get out of the house. And it just helps them all maintain that sense of normalcy and community and be a part of it. So just something to think about. Um, as they get further into the memory issues, maybe if you're working with your local care home, they might have a memory issue ward. And you might, they may ask if you can come and present or do things on there. And sometimes it'll feel and look very different than presenting on the regular or someone that's experiencing severe memory issues. They might be really closed down, shut down. And so you might not be getting that response that you're used to, but I, I assure you that you are reaching them. So it is really worth doing. Um, if you find yourself in a situation where you're working with memory care and you would like some more specific information, definitely feel free to reach out. I'm not going to turn the whole presentation into a memory care, but I, I could. So um, is anyone out there working with a memory care ward? Uh, 
And I'm just keeping an eye on the questions in case anybody has anything yeah. they want to contribute. Um, Kyle has indicated that uh, technically they do in Barhead. Um, <laughs> I've done it. It's it can be really frustrating, but it can be really rewarding. So, um, but I will mention a lot of what we're, I'm going to talk about going forward. The program plans I've done and run, I've run with both memory care peop, um, wards, but I've also used with regular wards, and I've also incorporated it in our programming here at the library. So, it's not hard to incorporate. So, a lot yeah. of what I'm going to talk about will address that. Uh, Kyle follows up, we get asked to deliver a lot to the facilities. Uh, very few patrons come to visit the library. Um, yeah. Shannon says in Camrose, they do a lot of work uh, with uh, these uh, awards. And then uh, Michelle Elliott says that uh, their library, uh, Camrose, has actually received a grant uh, this summer from AHS to uh, work on services for this population. So very Perfect. encouraging. Oh, that's good. I'm glad to hear it's on other people's radar too, because it is so, so necessary. <laughs> so we're going to jump into the planning now. So um, this is kind of the steps I go through when I'm planning. It works well for me. I, I don't know if it works for everyone, but I will give you what I do. And hopefully there's stuff you can glean from that. So one of the first things I do is I start to gather information. So I do my research. I look at what others are doing. This is where I'm asking those key community members what, what they'd like. I look at what's worked well in the past. I'm still pretty new here at Carstairs. So this is where I start talking to the staff. Hey, what have we done in the past? Have we done this? What went well? What didn't? And we start talking about it that way. And then I begin to identify my goals. So what do I hope to accomplish with this program? Um, what change do I want to see? How does this tie into our plan of service? All of that sort of work happens there. And that just sets me up for grant writing really well. It sets me up to locate my partners, which is the next step. So you're going to look for those organizations and community groups that you can work with. Um, sometimes I've had it where the partners have come to me first and so then I've had to go back and do steps one and two and that's it that works fine too sometimes they've done those first two steps and they're coming with their ideas but this is where we start to share those ideas this is where we're going to write those grants and proposals and then we move into the nitty-gritty of the planning and running the programs this is where we're deciding will it be a one-off program or a series of programs Who's going to be leading it? What supplies do we need? What's it going to? Did I mute myself? Sorry. You just cut out there for just a couple seconds. You're good. Okay. Excellent. Um, and we're going to then, after the program, this is the step that's easy to miss: is the evaluate. So this is where I gather feedback from the participants. But I also do a lot of if reflective practice. And I think my staff are really tired of me asking them these three questions. What went well? What could we do differently? And what are we going to stop doing? So we spend a lot of time on those questions. But I, I like to ask it that way because then we can identify um, what needs to change and, and what sometimes you just need to stop some things. So <laughs> it's easy to get into the pattern of doing it forever. Um, are there any questions about that? Okay, then I'm going to jump into my planning template and I'm going to try to switch applications. And while she's taking care of that, I would like to point out that uh, I believe this uh, planning worksheet is available as a file under your handout section. So make sure you take a look there to get, grab a copy of this. Yeah, so you're gonna get this planning worksheet and I'm, I'm just gonna show you the first part is just completely blank. Hopefully you guys are seeing this Word document. Correct, Ben? Everything looks good. Okay, so this is a sample program that I you'll get with this. It's the one I call my favorite place. It worked really well. I've really enjoyed it. Um, it's a armchair travel type program. 
I categorize it as a learning program and it worked really well in a care home setting. It's about a one hour program for older adults. The objective is pretty broad. It's a one-off program, but it's really a chance to get to know the seniors better, to introduce myself and get them to know me, learn where they've been, what's made them happy, and some build those some connections and learn together. Um, I like to, whenever I plan a program, think about how I can include as many senses and resources as possible. So I, I use a brainstorming sheet like this and just plug plunk things in um, and it works well for me. And I'm gonna go down so that you guys can see the whole program, but I'll talk through how these elements um, worked into the program as we go down. And this one is one of those really easy setups. I just bring either a projector, we have a portable one here, or you can connect your laptop to an HDMI if, there's, if you're at a location that has a TV. Um, that works just as well. Make sure you have those touch items ready and you're pretty much set to go. And then you'll need the PowerPoint. This link will let work. So you, when you have the program, you'll be able to click on the link and go and see the whole program. I believe my speaker notes are even in there and everything. So that should be all ready for you if you want to take this and adapt it for yourself. Um, I always write tips and tricks for myself after the program. This is some of my reflections. So like, make sure you leave time for people because I can talk too much. Ask individuals directly instead of a big group ask. That always gets more people talking. Um, and be open to sharing about my own experiences. So I'm just going to show you the presentation. I've, I've pulled it out into here, but this would be like a Google Slides presentation starts off with my favorite place it is based off of a book called my favorite place where they have different celebrities wrote like a, a short chapter about their favorite place and so i just picked a few to highlight from there so i picked alex trebek his favorite place is um hayworth haworth england it was the home of the bronte family so usually I put this up, make sure everyone knows who Alex Trebek is in the room. Sometimes somebody hasn't, doesn't put in place who he is. We talk about Jeopardy. And then I read a short passage, short excerpt from the book where he talks about why it's his favorite place. And then I go to a slide where we look at some pictures of the place. Um, I had a video link. Um, it's embedded, so then we go to that video and we do a short three minute like video tour of this small town. Um, and that's that kind of wraps up Alex Trebek. And then we go to a slide where I talk about what is your favorite place? Where do you have fond memories? Often I ask it and then there's sort of crickets. So then I start to like go up to individual people and be like, no, no, Susie, I know you. Where is your favorite place? Where, where do you makes you happy to think about? And if you can get one or two sharing, then usually a few more will share too. Um, and it works quite well. With memory care, I don't target people because they might not be able to remember or be able to articulate. And that can be really frustrating. So that's the one modification I make. So for memory care, instead of this question, I show the happy video. So it's the Pharrell Williams happy song, but it's um, seniors homes here in Canada. One of them did it and the seniors are dancing and lip syncing along with it. It's very fun and it just puts some energy back into the room and breaks up me just talking. Um, and then I switch to put on my tour guide hat and I share my favorite place. So I talk about how I went to India and I really enjoyed it. It's somewhere I'd always wanted to be and go. I show only a few photos. This isn't meant to be like my two hour travel memoir. This is meant to be sort of short. And that's when I bring out the saris I brought back from India. I bring back a jar of like chai seasoning spice. And we go around and we get to, I talk about like how the saris are different across India and we look at some of the bright colors and we get to touch and feel the different ones. 
And then I talk about the smell of the market and the chai spices and I bring that around and we get to smell it. So there's that tactile and I also get that moment where I get to talk one on one with someone while they're smelling the spice or while they're um, touching and that's the moment where I really find I get to build some connections. It takes time to go through a room like that, but it's really worthwhile to build those connections. And then we go into the question, is there some place you've always wanted to go? If you could go anywhere, where would you go? I do leave this one in with memory care. I do that kind of a question because there's usually someone in the room that'll answer, even if it's a caregiver or a nurse or somebody will share. And so it, there's a little bit of discussion that can happen. And it's not so much that you have to remember where you've been, you can just, you know, something might spark a reminder and they might be ready to chat by this point. And then I wrap up with Jane Goodall. So again, I read the excerpt from the book. Um, we remember who Jane Goodall is. And then we look at some pictures of some really cute chimpanzees and watch a short video that the Institute in um, Gom Gombe um, put together. It's another little three minute video. And that's it. That is the that presentation and the planning kind of that goes into putting together something like that. Um, in general, a presentation like this, once I have the idea, takes me about two hours to put together, but I've been doing them for quite a while. I think if you're new to it, it can take a little bit longer, but it's a pretty easy way to put something together and connect. So, and it's just one example. I have a lot more programs to share with you, but that's just the one. Does anyone have any questions about the planning or that specific program? Uh, Shannon indicated that she really loved the introduction of uh, senses to the program. Um, Holly, is, oh, sorry, oh, I'll let you finish I was going to say that is something that I started to include after I did some research on memory care, is that the more senses you can engage in a program, the better for their memory and for their, um, just as a brain workout, so. Um, yeah, and I, um, I actually had an interesting session I did with a group of older adults where I introduced Google uh, Maps, uh, Google mm. Earth, and I would uh, kind of just kind of use the platform to do the um, 360 degree views of locations that they would mention. So they'd like mention a place that they liked and then I would just kind of move to that place in the planet and kind of show it to everybody, which was uh, everybody had a lot of fun with. Um, but on that note, Holly asked a question, have you done this with no technology? I have. I've had it where the technology has not, you know, the presentation has not worked. Um, in that case, I played the music from my phone for the happy song. Um, I read from the book. We couldn't show the YouTube videos, so I just, you know, we kind of talked about where it was. If I'd known going in that it wasn't going to work, I would have printed photos to show, and we could have passed around photos about Eng the photo England photos and passed around um, some of the India photos and things like that. So you can do it. I I've done it mostly out of panic mode. The technology has failed at the last minute, but um, and that's worked just fine. So with prep, I think it would be even better because then you would have more tangible things to pass around or show. You could bring in a map, you could bring in a globe, all sorts of fun things could be done. So. Okay, yeah. I don't, uh, Holly says thanks and I don't see any other questions. Perfect. So now I'm gonna spend the longest time on this section. This is gonna be a bunch of sample programs. Um, and I'm just going to share some of my experiences and um, some of them are experiences of other people I know or programs I've learned of. Um, and in most cases, I'll direct you then <laughs> to who the expert is, but let's start. So these are the ones that um, I break my programs into what they do. So the first type of program that I have is connection building programs. And these were the ones that were running really well here at Carsters when I arrived. So some of these the, um, 
predate me. But the first one is our group here. We call them, well, they call themselves the Crafty Ladies. When I advertise, I advertise it as our Thursday crafternoon, but um, they prefer Crafty Ladies. And it's just a group of ladies that come together and crochet, they knit. I believe there's one lady that's doing um, embroidery, but it's just whatever needlework you can do kind of portable and they bring it with. But it's not really about the needlework for them. There's a lot of connection. Um, some of the ladies in this group have recently lost spouses or have just moved to the community. We get a lot of people retiring here to Carstairs and they don't have that community yet. And they come and they join this group and the core members that we've had for a long time are really good about um, connecting and checking in with each other and um they will talk and talk and chat throughout the whole time so they are fabulous um i'm getting a warning that my network is being having difficulties so if i'm cutting out let me know i will stay on top of that but so far so okay. good okay oh no we jumped forward how do i go back there we go um, our Let's Talk program is actually an example of a program that came from Alberta Health Services. So they came to us with an idea for a kind of coffee group focused around mental health topics. And it, it went okay, um, but they eventually pulled out of it because it wasn't going well enough for them. And we changed the focus here a bit to be just a let's talk about different current event topics, maybe retirement topic, topics. So we brought in someone from the CRA to talk about retirement and taxes. Um, we talked about a documentary one time and it's been very good that way. It's not a huge group, but it's a, it is a chance to talk about some of those issues and changes that are happening. Um, we did a lot of talking about aging in place at home because that was of deep interest to a lot of people we found out. Um, I include our book clubs in this because it's not so much about learning about the book, but about connecting with people over the book. Um, movie screening, on the far side of the screen, you'll see some lovely people with tea. Um, that was, we did Downton Abbey, we screened the movie, but you had to come have afternoon tea with us first. So we had the afternoon tea. The lady in the hat was so excited. She made us cucumber sandwiches to go with all the goodies I'd put in. And we had tea. I brought in teacups. Um, and then we watched the movie and we were all fancy. It was a lot of fun. Um, we do, we've partnered with the high school to offer a seniors tea um, once a year. Um, it obviously hasn't run the last little bit, but and we're sad about that, but hopefully it'll come back. And one that I'm dying to try but haven't been able to get going yet is uh, caregiver's coffee. So a time where those people that are, are taking care of someone in their home or maybe their spouse is in care and they're splitting their time and trying to take care, a time where they can come and have coffee together and just connect. And um, there might be presentations, there might not. Um, but I'm still working on that idea. Um, hopefully post COVID here, I'll be able to put that into a little more uh, action. So the next topic is I do is like learning. So these are um, things that we're learning something. So this is where those topic presentations like my favorite place live. Um, one I did that went over really well was the When Rock and Roll Goes Wrong, Band Breakups. That one's a lot of fun to talk about. Got people reminiscing and talking. Um, another one that I did was um, after the Rio Olympics. Um, what I did was we did a, we looked back on it, but we did it through the eyes of the different social media posts that the um, athletes had shared. And it was a sneaky way to teach people about social media. So we learned like what an Instagram post looks like. And we looked at those. We went to Facebook. We looked at um, Snapchat. And like we did some of those things. 
and it was a lot of fun. They got to see what the artist, um, the athletes were sharing and what it looked like for them to be at the Olympics. But we did learn about social media in a sneaky, sneaky way. So I recommend th those can be really easy to put together. Um, this is where I include things like guest speakers, take advantage of all those community uh, connections you might have and have them come in to talk. The photo at the top of the lovely lady in the um, plaid skirt, that is a former colleague of mine, Anna Maria. And um, she, her boyfriend works for the police department. And so she booked the canine unit to come talk to this group of seniors. So the week before she talked about like what the canine unit is and the history of it. And then this week the dog came to visit them and came in and they got to meet the dog and see that. And it was a great like guest speaker joint opportunity. And I always think the canine unit gets us to go to schools a lot, but they don't always get to talk to, you know, adults in the community and the, they loved it. So it was, it went down as an epic success. Um, this is where we do our documentary screenings. Um, one, I am again dying to run and I'm working on it, but it'll probably be next spring before we get it in place, is to set up a repair cafe. So this isn't necessarily exclusively for older adults, but the um, goal is to get people in the community, maybe recently retired, who have skills either in electronics, sewing, anything that could be done to repair things and to have them come one one Saturday every so often and people can come in and bring their things and learn to repair their own things. So instead of just throwing away the toaster that doesn't work, you would bring it here, talk with some of the volunteers and um, repair it. So this one would really appeal to those like close to retirement age that have skills to share. And I'm really excited and hopeful that we can get that one going. Uh, we've had a lot of success here in Carsters. Genealogy has been a huge interest. Um, so I get guest speakers in and they meet every month for about an hour or two and just share what they've been doing and sh share their research, ask questions of one another and work together to put together that genealogy. And that's where also that virtual travel trips come in. So any questions on those? before I jump to slide, the next section. <laughs> and uh, while we're waiting for any potential questions, I did want to take a moment to do a bit of self-promotion on the topic of the Repair Cafe. Um, mm -hmm. We have uh, put together a uh, repair kit that's available to uh, YRL member libraries. Uh, that includes all manner of screwdrivers, pliers, spudgers, um, wrenches, uh, that you might need to disassemble or reassemble devices of all makes and sizes. So just something to keep in mind. You're always a step ahead of me, Ben. I'm impressed. <laughs> I'm putting some of that together here and I'm trying to get enough money to get a sewing machine to live here or get one donated and just so we can do all sorts of that repair stuff. But um, COVID has kiboshed so many things and that's one of them that's just been on hold. Just a delay. Anyway, yeah, I just see a no, oh, sorry, I see no questions in the, the chat, so feel free to carry on. Perfect. So the next category I do, and this one is my favorite, is intergenerational. Um, I got really excited about intergenerational programming when I was in Germany visiting some family, and that's probably now almost 20 years ago. Um, but we were there and the care home my um, husband's grandmother lived in also was a daycare and it also was a home for people with low income it was a home with for people who might have mobility issues it was just a beautiful community and it was she loved it because she could go down and sit in the garden and watch the kids play and she didn't feel like she was tucked up in a home and forgotten about and it's right in the heart of the town. And so she could walk just across the street was the market. And like, it was beautiful in planning. And that is when my head went, 
oh, we don't need to lock everyone in their boxes. Um, so intergenerational programming has been an interest of mine for a while since then. Um, a brilliant example of intergenerational programming is called Now and Then Kits. And it was put together by Jen Waters, who works for Edmonton Public Library. Um, she is worth um, asking about because she is super passionate about them. But what they are is they are kits that she got a grant to put together with her teens and her seniors. And they would sit down and they'd pick a topic. So like one of the topics is music. And the teens and the seniors at the music table brainstormed who was popular and who was that. So the teens were putting in, you know, their Justin Bieber poster and the seniors were putting in their, I forget, but their Elvis poster say. And they were talking about then how Elvis and Justin are similar and, and what, what those connections and they were forming those connections. So now they've got these suitcases that are full of these artifacts posters, CDs, music samples, pictures, and um, you can take them out now and a school and a senior center could come together and dig through these and have conversations. So it's like a conversation starter. Um, uh, they are a fabulous way to get teens and adults, older adults sharing and talking and finding some common ground and it gave them a project. Um, I think one is on cooking. She has one on toys, um, just all sorts of cool topics. So, and it was relatively easy to put together um, once she got the right groups. It was getting her groups lined up um, for it. And it's something I'd like to bring here and try because I, I think it's a little easier here in the small town. I have one lodge, seniors lodge, and I have one high school, so I can approach those and hopefully zip them together to create this as a project. It's just finding those right partners. Um, one that we were doing before COVID that was going really well was senior center story time. So what we would do is we would have our story time and we'd take it over to the senior center. And we tended to do it right around a holiday. So thanks, um, not Thanksgiving, Halloween and Christmas and Easter. And what we do is the weeks leading up to going, our kids would practice their rhymes and kind of learn them so that they would be at their cutest, most knowledgeable selves when they got there. And we would do our story time. They'd sing their rhyme and songs. The seniors would be invited to participate. And usually the senior center would prepare something. So at Halloween, the seniors had candy to give to the kids. Um, at Christmas, they had gingerbread cookies prepped and the kids got to decorate them with the seniors. Um, and I forget what we did for Easter. I apologize, but I don't really remember that one. But it was, it's been great. Um, the kids love getting to see the seniors. The seniors love getting to see the kids. We try and build in a chance for them to interact. Um, kids have no filters and are adorable and they just, they love it. So it's been a really good one. Um, this is another one that I'm borrowing. I forget which library I heard it from, but it was a teen tech help. So what they did is they set the teens up to be their tech experts and um, older adults could come in with their device and get tech help from the teens. And they said it had been really successful. I'm very intrigued by it. And maybe as our teen advisory board grows here, we're just starting it. Maybe it's something we can look at doing down the road. Um, Adopt a Grandparent is a program my grandmother participated in in Fort Saskatchewan and she loved it. So she was assigned, I don't know, some, some random child from the school and they would visit like four times a year. And she would come and they'd do some uh, craft together. Her adopted grandchild would come prepared with like a poem to share or something. And they'd just sit and spend time together. And it was especially targeting children that didn't have um, grandparents in their lives. And at this point, my I was grown. And so my grandmother didn't have small grandchildren around anymore. So she got to have that connection. And she loved it and looked forward to it all the time. 
And um, it sounds like her little grandchild, adopted grandchild very much enjoyed it too. I never, because of privacy, met the grandchild, but by all accounts, it was very popular with the kids too. Another example that lots of people run is Reading Buddies can be a really great intergenerational program. Um, pairing those adults with younger readers, um, get them engaged and working together. And we're taking our story walk and making it intergenerational. So our story walk will be moving every, every week of the summer to different locations. And one of the weeks we are setting it up at our seniors, local seniors lodge, they will know in advance and it's a great chance for them to invite their younger family members to come visit them and they have something they can do together. They can go outside and walk the story walk together, read it together. Um, the little ones burning off their energy a little bit and yet they still have something to talk about and do together. So we're excited and hopeful that that one will be a good partnership and a good opportunity. So any questions about intergenerational? Uh, while we're waiting for questions to trickle in, mm -hmm. um, I am also in the process of just getting ready to roll out our own circulating story walk kit. And I'm just mm -hmm. kind of curious as to which titles you selected for your intergenerational programming using that platform. This year we we went easy on our story walk. So we booked TD offered a story walk for free. And so we've booked that and we're having them send it because it comes with all of the stakes to put in the ground. It's all printed and ready to go. Um, it looks like a decent book. I'm forgetting the title, I apologize. Um, but it is a bit of a risk that way because we didn't hand pick the book, but it fits in with our uh, summer reading club theme and because it came ready made, I really, I feel like it saved us so much time. So, Fair enough. but if it, it goes well, proposition. <laughs> yeah, if it goes well, we'll definitely um, redo it in the future. This way we've got all the equipment too. So, cause like we get to keep it. They're sending oh. us a story walk and we get to keep all the pieces. So hopefully they're reusable. <laughs> Yeah, fingers crossed. I don't see any uh, questions coming through, so feel free to continue. Oh, okay. hold on. Uh, oh. We do have one comment from Melissa that says, the TD story walk uh, story is the thing Lou couldn't do. So That's thank you. it. It's like, I I'm like, I should know. It's just, there's a lot in my brain right now. <laughs> Keeping track of all of it at once. Um, and my final category for programs is technology. And this is one that sometimes we overlook because we don't always associate seniors and technology, but I've had actually a lot of success. Um, <clears throat> the one we do here, one-on-one -on -one tech help is pretty much exclusively seniors come in for tech help. Very necessary, very well used. I have taken that same program and done it where I've been one day a week at the seniors lodge doing tech help. And that's been really good. I've done everything from teaching people how to online shop to setting up devices to downloading pictures of grandchildren. Um, often I get someone comes and they're like, so and so gave me this, but I don't know what to do with it. Um, so yes, and we don't just focus on um, library technologies exclusively. We will help with whatever, with the caveat that there may come a point where we'll be like, you have to go to the Apple store or you have to go to the genius, you know, Google store or something because we can navigate software issues, but I can't fix hardware. I'm, I just can't, <coughs> pardon me. Um, the other thing we do, we lend out daisy readers. I'm sure most of you do. It's a pretty easy technology. Um, sorry. Um, another thing is you can use your maker space or your maker equipment. Um, so you can see in these pictures, in the one I've got the little bits with, and I took them out to the senior center and I put them on the table and I made them play with them. <clears throat> and they had a blast. 
Um, and the lady, you can see her, most of her, um, at the end told me, I did not know this. She was an electrical engineer. And she was so excited to see how easy they'd made it to learn about electricity. And she was going to buy a set for her grandchild afterwards. Like she was so excited to get to, to use that part of her training and her background and to see how we're doing that with kids. And I told them, like, it's just a chance for you to test out what the kids are playing with. Um, the other one we had a lot of success with, and you can see there, is using our green screen. So we went on a virtual trip and then we did travel photos. And we talked about how green screens worked and we asked them to come and the lady there was so excited. We buried her in the sand in the photo with the green screen and she was just, she was tickled pink. And we printed a copy for her and she took it everywhere to show everyone that she'd gone to the beach with us. So um, it, it doesn't have to be a no-go. <laughs> Um, the maker equipment can work really well there. Um, it's just in how you approach it and your enthusiasm can carry it. Um, I know of a lot who have had a lot of success with different types of podcasting or memory recording with seniors. So you bring that voice recorder and you get them to record a memory on it and then they can share that. Um, there is a gentleman in his late 90s who has started a podcast and he is fabulous so I often share about him and so podcasting is a good fit because it's really all you need is a recording device and most phones and things have that or you can just purchase a simple re digital recorder hit hit record and you can capture that type of thing um, the robots can be a really fun one to bring in and engage um, if you have like a dash and dot just because they're ridiculously cute. My only caveat is as when I'm with seniors, I don't run them on the floor um, just because as with most grown-ups, we forget to look down <laughs> and they get tripped on. And um, with seniors, tripping is just so much higher, so much higher risk. If I fall, it's not, I'm not going to break things. If they fall, they could. So I tend to put them up on a table or a surface just so that they're at a little more on eyesight. Kids remember to look down, grown-ups don't. So that is my one learning with that is running them up or waiting till everyone settled in the room and then running them <laughs> around a little bit. But they can be a really fun one too. Um, and like even with technology, the one time I was having tech problems and my presentation wouldn't load. And so we're just staring at my desktop on the projector screen. And actually I did a whole program off on Lib on that because they were curious as to what was all the things on my desktop were and what they did. And that morphed into going to the web page and talking through like some of the digital resources the library had. And afterwards, the one lady thanked me because no one had taken the time ever to talk her through that and explain, like, they say ebooks, but what does that mean? You say this, but what does that mean? And they never wanted to ask because no one likes to look stupid. So sometimes it's worth, like, really going back to those basics and just just filling in those gaps because sometimes they just want to understand what people around them are talking about without having to stop the conversation to ask. So that's why I think technology is really important. Um, technology is the one category that I haven't had a lot of success with memory care wards with. Just it's it it hasn't worked well. So I would say experiment but try, I would say that it's probably the one that you probably are going to give more of a pass there. And that brings me to the end. I don't know where I'm at with time. Sorry, Ben, I've lost my clock. <laughs> but are there any questions? And uh, I think we're doing good for time. Um, it is 2.25, so we're just coming up on a full hour. So um, while we are waiting for people to furiously 
type out their questions before the deadline falls. I, I do want to thank you for uh, uh, coming out to visit uh, Yellowhead Regional Library System <laughs> and share your knowledge and expertise with us. Um, we're looking forward to kind of keeping this on hand for everybody else to explore at their own pace in the future. Um, I think this is going to be a good piece of evergreen content for us. And um, yeah. And uh, yeah, look forward to uh, any future conversations <laughs> or ideas that get sparked as a result of this. So, well, yeah, I, I'd love it if anyone out there is, has some great ideas. Feel free to shoot me an email and share them. Um, chat with me about emails. Um, at the beginning of the presentation is my email. I'm, I, I'm always excited about older adult programming. Um, I don't know why. They just make me happy. They're a fun group to work with. I, I always thought I'd be a children's librarian, but now I think I'm more of a older adult <laughs> librarian right now. Uh, we do have two comments that came through. Uh, one from Gail, just saying, no questions. Your presentation was very good. Lots of ideas. Thank you. And uh, Kyle indicates, uh, let's see, with memory care and tech help, it has been beneficial for myself to make visual cards. For example, mm -hmm. steps to use an app, screenshots of every action, printed and stapled together like a miniature tech book. Um, that's actually a good one. I've, I've even used that just for you know older adults in my own family where they're visiting and they want to know how to turn on the TV. So I'll just print like a little picture of our remote control with arrows pointing to which buttons they need to use and things like that. I've done it too with some that have come in for tech help, not not just older adults, anyone, where I like draw out the symbols and put like go to settings and settings looks like and it is very helpful, um, especially if you remember and I always encourage people when I'm doing tech help to take notes uh, or I'll write it out while we're going through and then give them that handwritten mm -hmm. directions because and and I also stress with seniors um, how to safely write down your password and store it because they get uh, the expectation is that we'll all remember all the time and we know that's not possible. So then I, I like to share tips on how to safely write down your password and store it somewhere separate and don't don't just tape it to the back of your iPad as, as easy as that would make life. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but. Just little tips like that can be really helpful, even for beginning memory care, or even just me. I I need to know where to save my password safely too. So. <laughs> yep. 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 Uh, we did have a question from uh, Holly uh, asking, "Are you going to try and contact senior centers this summer?" Um, we've been in touch all throughout the pandemic. Every two or three months we reach out and ask how things are going. Is there anything they need? Um, we have done some drop off of large print materials to them and we, we've quarantined it, give it to them, they quarantine it. We've done a little bit of that. Um, we did hearts on the lawn for, um, for Valentine's Day. We had kids, we did want to take home kit where kids and teens decorated hearts and then we in the night set them all up on their lawn for them to surprise them in the morning. So we've actually been doing some work uh, even though they've been very very locked in and very protective understandably. Um, we have had that connection. Um, I've tried to reach out to any of our community partners every couple months just to connect. Um, our our, we have a ukulele circle that's mostly older adults that haven't been able to meet, but I've been reaching out. Do you want songs printed? Can I photocopy? What can I give you? Um, just to keep those connections. So um, yes, the answer I guess is yes, I will be reaching out and I'm starting to talk to them about fall already. What, yes. what, what are they predicting? What are they feeling? Yeah. Yeah, Thankfully I think it's a great they've... point too that uh, these are just kind of relationship things that you know yeah. you need to tend to even if you can't do exactly what you were hoping to do. Yeah, yeah, because we originally had asked if they wanted like we've done take home kits for adults. Um, we do a travel with your taste buds, which is a sample of tea and a sample of spice and we asked if they wanted that um, we've done adult maker kits where you explore a different craft this month was whittling 
So they got a block of wood and some soap to practice <laughs> whittling on and te some tips and techniques. They hadn't asked, they didn't want any of that, but we've been connecting throughout. So I, I, I recommend it with anything. Community partners reaching out and connecting. We've connected to our daycares and day homes too, even though we can't go in. We're dropping off books, we're dropping off information packets. So uh, we do have another follow-up question from Kyle. Uh, and this is kind of on that engagement piece. How did you get your teenager volunteers to help with high adult programming such as uh, tech help uh, tech help? Is there any improvement strategy? I haven't, yeah. That one I haven't had going. Um I'm hoping we just started a teen advisory board right before the pandemic hit and they've managed to weather through, but they're very young. They're like 13. Ah. So they're very young. So we're hoping to grow them. And what I'm hoping that by the time they reach 15, 16, that we'll be able to transition them into maybe some, some partnerships. They're a pretty self-possessed group already at 13. They're quite impressive. So I think by 16, they're going to be amazing, but I haven't. It was a program. I'm sure I saw it. It was one a library out of the states that had it. I will have to look that one up off the top of my head. I'm not remembering, but they had recruited and then they did some training with the teens on like how to do it and how to do tech help and then unleashed them on book sessions with the seniors. So it was like an after school. Yeah, I think that's a really sneaky approach too, because you're you're kind of promising, hey, teen advisory board, which uh, I know even um, in my last position, uh, the Terwilliger Rec Center was starting a teen advisory board to help kind of guide programming and engagement that they did within the recreation center. Um, mm -hmm. But then you say like, okay, now we've got this other need. How can we help address this need with your resources and expertise that you've developed in this capacity? So. Well, and I do know um, a lot of our teen advisory board are part of from our homeschooling families and a lot of their homeschool curriculums require them to do some volunteer work. So this mm -hmm. is also it's sort of um, we're hoping to grow them into that knowledgeable volunteer. We might start them off with a children's program assistant and get them comfortable with that and then sort of transition them up. But it also could be something you could talk to a teacher at your high school. Maybe they have a tech program and they're looking for something for those kids to do. Volunteers, I think in the public, they still have to get so many volunteer hours. To mm -hmm. do, so it, it, it's about who you know sometimes and, and what partnership you can put together. It's just one that I'm like super, I think it could be amazing and free us up from some of that one-on-one -on -one tech. And, yeah. Who better to teach TikTok than the kids who use it? Let's let's be honest. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, um, I believe that takes us just a little bit past time. I've seen that a couple people have had to excuse themselves uh, for other things. Yeah. Um, there are a few more comments, all thanking you profusely for your wonderful tips, tricks, and expertise. Um, so with that, I can assume that if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to Megan directly. Um, feel free to share this recording freely with anybody who's interested in it, and uh, I will make sure that the uh, links to the planning document and her slides go up on our Niche Academy so that you can all review that at your own time. So once again, thanks for your time, Megan, and I hope you have a, uh, well, I guess the best summer ever. So <laughs> all right, take care.